Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning into this episode of the Ask Dr. Tony Show, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism. Hello, Dr. T. I'm wondering if you're back out on the road traveling around the world giving talks yet. Uh, yes, I am. Strangely enough, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, to, glad you mentioned that. I shall be heading for Oxford and London in January. And in January in particular, I'll be doing um, a basically uh, a masterclass uh, in diagnosis of autistic girls and women on one day. Second day is therapy and support for autistic girls and women. And the third day is emotion management in Oxford, pathological demand avoidance, and again, emotion management. So if you go to my webpage, tonyatwood.com.au, further information. So if you're in the UK, especially London, it'd be great to see you there. Oh, that's wonderful. It's, it's just so nice to hear you out there giving people what's current in the world of autism. And speaking of which, we have lots of questions today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So we had to be selective. We're gonna probably put a second show together within another two months, maybe three, uh, but let's get right to them. We had lots of questions this time about diagnosis. Here's the first one. Hi, Dr. Tony. I rank in all categories that I have been tested in as being Aspie, but I have good coordination and played team sports all my life. Specialists think that that would make it not possible for me to be diagnosed as Asperger's. Is it possible that I'm just an exception to that rule? A very interesting question. And there are exceptions. And some of the information that people you may have talked to about Asperger's are a little bit obsolete in our understanding. Now, first of all, often autistic girls are good at uh, dexterity coordination. So they are gymnasts, they, they have ballet, they do basketball, they do a whole range of things, team sports in particular. So in many ways, the poor coordination tends to be associated more with autistic males. But in autism, there is a different distribution of abilities. In general sense, uh, in statistics terms, there is a bell curve. Most people are in the middle, fewer at the extremes. In autism, it's not a bell curve, it's a U curve, huh. where there are fewer in the middle and more at the two extremes. So I have known autistic individuals who have been superb at dexterity. They've won Olympic medals, actually, I know in swimming, rowing, and a, a, a number of other sports too, because when the autistic person chooses to do something, they will excel at it to Olympic uh, level of performance. But there's other components of that is that the sporting activities are exercise, great for managing emotions, but also I've noticed at school, autistic kids who are in team sports are less likely to be bullied because you are demonstrating something that's valued by your peers and your team members will come to your rescue. Mm -hmm. So I do encourage that. Uh, I'm delighted that you are good at team sports, but um, yep. It, it does occur. Excellent. Here's the next question about diagnoses. I'm exploring whether or not I fit the bill for ASD, and so I'm reading books and other materials. A few years ago, I read Quiet by Susan Cain, and I self-identified as an introvert. I feel that many of the aspects on social and emotional interactions that go into the clinical diagnosis of ASD are closely aligned with introversion but there's very little, if any, reference to this anywhere. So my question is, what is the relationship between ASD and introversion? Is introversion a feature of ASD? Is it necessary or sufficient? Or are they completely unrelated? Introversion and extroversion are normally considered personality characteristics. And in autism, you can have both. Certainly the introvert is identified by being alone, not necessarily lonely, enjoying their own company, as I say, has found something more interesting and enjoyable than socializing. But you can also get the autistic extrovert who wants to engage with others, is highly motivated to do so. But when we look at what is introversion, it's someone who's more reserved, reflected, uh, more interested in one's own emotional and mental state than that of other people. And we find with introverts that their energy dwindles in social interaction. And there are certain individuals 
who really have to use a huge amount of energy to socialize. So I would say that often when I'm exploring an autistic person, we have all the diagnostic dimensions, but I also look at personality. Who is the person? And some of those characteristics can include introversion. Nothing in autism is unique. What you have in autism, it takes an ordinary characteristic, introversion, to a greater depth, but it's not unique. Hmm. Dr. Tony, I'm a 37-year-old female Aspie who was diagnosed a year ago. I'm also a mental health professional, and I'm currently transitioning into full-time academia, conducting research pertaining to autism. Good for you. I have a difficult time relating to the perception of all autistic people processing information in a concrete and literal fashion, as I am a highly abstract thinker. I have a very high IQ and relatively high EQ. In one of your books, you described autism as a difference in cognition, perception, thinking, and relating to the world. Can you please talk about misperceptions of autistic people? I feel that people don't perceive me as autistic, save only for my intense interests. Also, more broadly, what are your thoughts on autism as a heterogeneous condition? <laughs> okay. Now, yes, uh, myths and so on. The, the concept I think you've got in there of being uh, concrete and literal. In autism, that tends to be concrete and literal in social conversations taking people by what they say literally, not necessarily seeing behind the words, the thoughts and feelings and so on, and very concrete pedantic. That is a linguistic, cognitive, social characteristic. However, a fat characteristic I've known of autism right from the beginning is a remarkable ability with visualization, which includes imagination and also the use of metaphor, because metaphor is a visualization. And often in academia and uh, various aspects of intellectual pursuit, the person has an extraordinary imagination and visualization. Temple Grandin is a classic example, but also an association with analysis of systems and patterns. So my view is that the concrete literal is more <coughs> social than, shall we say, your thinking style. Now, uh, when we look at EQ, uh, empathy quotient, we divide empathy into three components. One is cognitive. That is the ability to read someone's face, uh, to read the context, tone of voice, gestures, and so on, that help you know what someone is thinking and feeling. Now, in autism, that can be, it's basically visual and auditory, what do you see, what do you hear, may not be their best way of processing what someone is thinking and feeling. Now, that may mean that they didn't process that somebody is embarrassed or uh, their particular subtle emotions are occurring. Don't respond as anticipated, then accused of lacking empathy, but it's more didn't read the cognitive cues. But the second uh, empathy component is emotional, to feel. Now, my view is that in autism, this is a sixth sense. It's not what you see. It's not what you hear. It is an ability to perceive what's going on using different sensory channels. It's what we call extraception. As much as you can perceive what you hear, see, etc., as uh, too intense, a sensory component, but I think there's also an extraordinary sensitivity to the emotional states of others by unconventional channels. Mm -hmm. And that is felt very strongly. It can be very upsetting. Other people's <clears throat> emotions are contagious. And one of the reasons for social withdrawal is to protect yourself from other people's emotions. Mm -hmm. But the third is behavioral, is knowing how to respond. So you may know that somebody's going through a particular emotion, but you're unsure and you don't want to make a mistake how to respond. You don't want to make the situation worse. And sometimes it's best to do nothing because you minimize the risk of being criticized and so on. So I think what we need to recognize is an autistic person can have extraordinary emotional empathy, but difficulty reading the signals conventionally in a photograph, for example, but also knowing what am I supposed to do in that situation. Very good. Now, here's a question that occurs quite often. 
kids that grew up with parents on the autism spectrum. And here's an example of what they asked us. Dr. Tony, you have mentioned your stepfather in a few of your lectures, and it seems that his ASD has impacted you as a child growing up. My son, five years old, has been recently diagnosed, and we have always suspected that my husband is on the spectrum. Can you please talk about the challenges of children of ASD parents, what they face, and what you would recommend to my husband either to do or read to improve his parenting skills? A central feature of autism is difficulty understanding people, and some of the most difficult ones to understand are children, especially teenagers. And the uh, autistic <coughs> parent may not have an intuitive understanding, but can be a remarkable reader and obtain factual information. So what I would recommend, please, read books on child <laughs> development, um, understanding natural childhood abilities and behavior uh, and how to respond, etc. So become an expert in it. If you're not too sure and your own childhood may have been spent in isolation, you need knowledge. So find out. There are lots of books on that. Now, there can be a difficulty in uh, wanting success and, and your children to succeed, but may focus on criticisms not compliments. And all kids, uh, autistic and neurotypical, need compliments, especially autistic kids, because they're often unsure. They're often criticized, but may not get compliments. And so it is to explain, if something is good, uh, say so. As with my stepfather, uh, his view was, well, why should I tell you you're good at something when you know that? I'm just saying what you know it's without bad. realizing, actually, it is useful to come from people. And then there can be a tendency to educate rather than play with the kids. So that imaginative reciprocal play was not necessarily part of their childhood. So it may be unfamiliar territory. What I say is, if your partner, this is a husband, your mm. neurotypical partner is an expert at this, watch them. They are your mentor and guide in what to do. Duplicate your NT partner. Mm. Um, there can also be an issue of discipline, of uh, being fairly sort of rigid of what's accepted and not. So there may need to be more accommodation in that area. But mm. a major one is the child's need for affection. Now that's affection by a hug and so on, also time and to actually say that they're loved. Now that affection needs to be given that it's not being earned. It's not, oh, you did so good and give them a hug. It's just coming up and giving them a hug because you feel like mm -hmm. it's not because they've earned it. Also to spend time with them rather than on your computer and to explore love. And there are books on, on children that will explore how much love and affection they will need. And to an autistic person, it's wow. <laughs> you want that much? Yep, afraid so. You have to be sorry for neurotypicals. They're such fragile flowers. They have to be told they're loved and hugged every day. Yep, I know once a month is all right for you, but they need it every day. All right, then I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> this is something else that we hear. In addition to kids with parents on the spectrum, we hear from professionals that have to deal with kids on the spectrum and talk to their parents about what they can and cannot get done at home. For instance, if tests are sent home, is the autistic parent unwilling or unable to complete it? Well, that's problematic because then nothing really gets done. So here's that question. I am a professional who works with kids. I would like to know how to use the questionnaires with the parents and the validity of these tests. What advice or encouragement could you offer us as professionals? As an author of various uh, screening tests, when I write a statement or question, I have at the back of my mind what this question is due to explore, but the parent doesn't know that. And so they're asked a question about something and they don't know, how do I answer this? Is there a hidden agenda here? I'm not sure. So often uh, when I'm doing a diagnostic assessment, I will send out the screening instruments and sometimes parents will, will write in, I don't get this, I don't understand and so on. And we'll say, yep, that's okay. But when we see you, we will go through what that is. In the diagnostic assessment, 
you're often validating and exploring more information on whatever they have said. For example, sensory sensitivity or playing with other kids. Can you give me examples of this and so on? Now, the screening instruments are designed to legitimize a formal diagnostic assessment. So, for example, the autism spectrum quotient developed by Simon Baron Cohen, Cambridge University. There's the children, adolescent and adult one, 50 questions, the standard one that is used, a score of maximum 50, general population score 16, autism 32. Hmm. So if you've got a score of 32, you're how should we say, you're predicting that they probably will have a diagnosis. Now, with my friends and colleagues, I've developed the GQ-ASC for adult women. Now, a score of 56 or more on that one identified 80% of autistic women. Now, the ASQ, Simon's uh, questionnaire, freely available from uh, the internet. My one on uh, autistic women is available from my webpage, tonyatwood.com.au. It'll be there. You can download it and use it in your own uh, professional work. And it gives you the, the scoring that goes with that. So we also have the issue of a parent's, sometimes they don't want the diagnosis so they will underplay the problems or they're desperate for support and understanding so they will amplify the mm. characteristics. It is their subjective view and they may have various agendas that we need to explore. So it's a useful screening instrument uh, and sometimes um, I get the, <laughs> the questionnaire back and I think, oh, I don't think autism's here from this questionnaire. And then I see the buzz and I go, oh yes, <laughs> it's yeah. definitely there. So they're useful tools, but they never replace a formal diagnostic assessment with further instruments and clinical wisdom. Mm. So I often say to the parents, when you filled in the questionnaire, were there any questions that were difficult? Uh, you, if you don't know how to answer, leave them blank. Mm. And when I see you, I'll explain what they are. Now we're moving on to the sensory category, brushing one's teeth. Dr. Tony, I'm a psychiatrist with a 48-year-old woman client who is unable to brush her teeth for weeks at a time. She is repulsed by the tactile sensation of toothpaste and residual food in her mouth, and it causes her tremendous shame. What advice would you offer her? Wow, uh, this is a 48-year-old woman. We often get this with kids, and this is an illustration of how that sensory sensitivity can almost be a lifelong problem. Now, this is really the province of an occupational therapist to assess this lady's sensory profile. And the mouth has an extraordinary sensitivity. It's, it's one of the issues with uh, restricted eating and so on because of the sensory, the aroma, the taste, the liquidity, the crunch, et cetera, of food mm -hmm. can be so aversive that there's a limited tolerance of certain foods. But here, it seems to be primarily tactile and I would recommend an assessment by an occupational therapist, maybe an OT that works more with children who can give advice. Now what you're trying to do is look for a way sometimes of numbing that area. There can be uh, substances that you can get for mouth ulcers and things like that which will numb that area and it may be possible to apply that for a moment, it effectively numbs it, then you can do your cleaning. Um, it also depends on if you use an electric toothbrush versus a manual one, but it's very much an occupational therapist's mm -hmm. approach of finding out how can we relatively numb the area. There may be something, if you're a psychiatrist, on prescription that will act as, as a mild anesthetic in that area. It's very real and it's a real problem for the yeah. individual. Wow. All right, this is in, under personal management, sleep disruption. I know there's an issue with sleep in our population. Hello, Dr. Atwood. My wife is having trouble maintaining any kind of sleep rhythm or pattern. Recently, she's reported the quality is good, but there are periods of months where it's terrible. As you can guess, it's terribly disruptive to her executive function and her mood. Are weighted blankets likely to be effective? And sleep hygiene hasn't really helped much at all. 
Do you have any other advice with dealing with sleep disturbances? Thank you. This is from Glenn. Yeah, very good question. First of all, for those who don't know, I'll explain what sleep hygiene is. It's not having a shower before you go to bed. <laughs> it's, it's basically, I don't know why they call it hygiene. It's weird. It's things like a very comfortable mattress, good curtains that will cut out light outside, not having coffee or tea before you go to sleep or watching TV in bed. So it's looking at your routines and so on. Now, to a certain extent, there are um, medications like melatonin, uh, that may help. But when we deal with autism, the, the problem is not necessarily biochemistry that needs to be repaired by melatonin and so on. It's rumination. And it seems that in autism, there's a tendency in the gap between watching TV, doing things and so on, and falling asleep. That vacuum can be filled with anxiety. It is analyzing the day gone by. What happened? Did I, did I make a mistake? Why did that face? What am I going to do about tomorrow? And these ruminations, these, uh, should we say, social autopsies, the planning for the day, make sleep more and more elusive. Mm -hmm. Also, the more you want to fall asleep, the more elusive it is. It, you can't just make yourself, you can't go, but I'm going to fall asleep. It, it doesn't work that way. It sort of sneaks up behind you and grabs you. So in a way, what may be important is speak to a psychologist if you can, because there are now programs called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, CBTI. There's usually four to six sessions and they will go through with you strategies to break free from ruminations. Mm -hmm. So it's the thoughts, it's the anxiety that is inhibiting speech, speech, sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not able to relax. Often in autism, the person says, I don't know how to relax. I can block it, but I don't know how to relax. They need help on that. Mm -hmm. You can't will yourself to sleep. So sometimes there is, um, should we say, a need for information uh, on the accuracy in terms of negative beliefs about sleep loss, which is self-fulfilling prophecy. And oh, yes, I haven't slept. That's, that's, that's why I was irritable in the day and so on. And you amplify that process more and more. So what I'm looking for here is that cognitive program, also mindfulness and behavior therapy for insomnia. Wherever you are in the UK, you may have psychologists that specialize in insomnia this way. But the good news is there are also now smartphone apps mm -hmm. that will link into your smartphone, which will measure REM sleep and a whole range of things. So the new complicated ones actually will give you an analysis of sleep. They tune in to that information and they can provide a six week CBT um, insomnia course for you on your iPhone. Mm -hmm. Now they create an algorithm that tailors the program specifically to your sleep cycle and so on. The first one is called Sleepio, S-L-E-E-P-I-O, Sleepio. And another one is Sleep Space. That will track information from your smart watch <laughs> and will help you design yeah. a program. So uh, those are some thoughts on sleep. But the main focus is in terms of it's the ruminations, it's the fear of I, I must fall asleep and that makes it more and more elusive. Mm -hmm. it, it's the old fashioned one of counting sheep. And, and that's a lot of wisdom. And I think that's appropriate. Or say, I'm not gonna focus on sleep. It will happen. I'll read a book, I'll do something. And then sleep will look up and I'll go. Because the more you want it, the more it mm -hmm. becomes evasive. Mm -hmm. Very true. This category is meltdowns. I have a special interest in space. I joined my college rocketry club. We went on a camping trip to launch rockets and I was excited, but it was really stressful. I didn't know anyone and I was extremely nervous. The change in routine was intense. I was already a bit overwhelmed as I had just moved cities. I suffered my first meltdown in years. I did not know how to explain this to the others. I was so embarrassed. I was also extremely confused and disorganized throughout, and I felt that I was being a burden 
and that others were having to babysit me. Now I feel too embarrassed to socialize with them. I also hear some of them complain about the mannerisms of another club member with ASD. And I think, if they feel that way about him, would they not feel the same way about me? I want to be involved as much as possible with rocketry, but I'm scared just to show up now. What do I do? Okay, in the very beginning is change of routine. In other words, um, going to college, uh, going away with a group of people, it was too much. Um, <clears throat> it's not a frequent event, but you reached your threshold, it went beyond that, and you had a meltdown. It's unfortunate, but it was there. Now, I would look at, if you can, to talk to a psychologist or a counsellor to prepare how to explain yourself to members of the rocket team, rocket group, just one-on-one -on -one of how could you explain to them the reason you had a meltdown. I was so stressed because I'd moved, I'd just started the course, these were new people, and I'm sorry, but I just lost it. So you need to rehearse what to say to other people. But you also need to say that I really do want to join this group, mm -hmm. but in case I'm stressed out again, these are some suggestions to help me. And this is where you go with your psychologist or counsellor. They need to know what to do. In other words, don't crowd around, don't whisper to each other. <laughs> One person mm -hmm. to deal with it, to be reassuring, to just listen, etc. So it's an explanation and a plan of what to do. Um, and also say to them at the beginning, when I had a meltdown, this must have been very confusing to you. I'm mm -hmm. deeply sorry that I did that, but I do need to tell you why. What was going on? You didn't know that at the time, but so much was going on in, in my life, I lost it. But if it ever happens again, these are the warning signs that may help you. Mm -hmm. If it does happen, this is what I would like you to do. And the person, if they really have a very serious meltdown, write down what to do on a card and they have it in their wallet. Mm -hmm. And if they are having a meltdown, they just pass the card and say, I'm sorry, but I'm having an autistic meltdown. I've been overwhelmed and I need personal space. I just need quiet for a moment. Mm -hmm. I'll be okay, but I'm best if I recover on my own. Please don't ask me what's the matter. Please don't ask me to explain what's going on. I'll get better by myself. Mm -hmm. Masking. Hi, and thank you for these videos. I'm in my early 20s, I'm a female, and recently diagnosed. This has led me to realize how much I have been masking. I now feel like I have no idea who I am, and I'm constantly feeling torn between doing what I should do as expected by society, such as eat lunch in the staff room and socialize, or do what I feel, what I want to do or need to do, because that may come across as strange or rude. Basically, I feel I don't know who I truly am. Is this common? And do you have any advice? Hmm. Two components of this one. Uh, but I may come across as strange or rude. People need educating uh, about why you prefer to <laughs> eat on your own. And again, it's like the previous question. It, it's going through, how can you explain to people? Okay, hi guys, I... Uh, so focus on my work, I need time out. For you, socializing, it's talking about the latest films and the things that you do and all sorts of social news is what refreshes you. For me, it's actually quite drawn, draining. I need some time alone to refresh myself. That's me, you don't have to use the A word. I'm the sort of person who finds socializing exhausting. It's not personal, I just do. So I need at lunchtime, to be on my own. It's okay, I'm all right. In fact, I'm very happy reading a book, looking at the newspaper, and uh, that's what I choose to do. Now, it may be that you talk with uh, either a counselor, therapist, parent, uh, sometimes um, a good friend who can go through with you the script of what to do. So it's basically explaining it because what we want is the neurotypicals to go, ah! Oh, it makes sense now. Oh, oh, that's fine then. It's when they don't know that they fill the gap with all sorts of prejudices. 
No, the big difficulty here is I don't know who I am. I know who I'm supposed to be. I can be the artificial me, but it's not the real me. I am living a lie. And there's one autistic person said recently, uh, I have friends, but they don't know me. And so there can be a lot of depression because you are an artificial self, which is exhausting and, and so on. It, it's something that I would recommend with a psychologist is the concept of self. Who are you? The real you. And to be able to explain that to other people. It is a very good coping mechanism. It's very understandable that you've learned how to camouflage your autism. Uh, it means that you, you get jobs, you get friends, you may have a relationship and so on. Um, but it does mean that it is exhausting to have that pretense. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times in life when you do need to act. When in Rome, do as Romans do. But if you do this all the time, it's very debilitating and it's going to make you depressed. So you say in your early 20s and recently diagnosed. This is also important from my perspective because I've often found that those who camouflage, when they've been diagnosed, should we say not too long afterwards, months or years, they often reduce the amount of camouflaging. There's more self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. I don't need to do that. I know who I am. I know there's a legitimate reason for it. I am not going to camouflage all the time. So I suspect that your recent diagnosis may provide a momentum to camouflage less often. Very good. We had lots of questions in the category of intimacy, dating, sex, and marriage. The first one, I don't know what I'm feeling. When I feel that someone is strongly attracted to me, I never know how I feel about it. I can't decide between what the real me is feeling and what I think I should be feeling at that moment. I know I'm expected to return the feelings, but I don't know if I'm really feeling that way or just think I should feel that way. As you can probably tell from this question, this often leads to emotional and practical relationship chaos. It's very stressful for me and those that are around me. So the question would be, how do I get clear about my own emotions? Mm. Now, you're, you're describing something that has been a puzzle to philosophers, <laughs> uh, poets and writers for thousands of years. What is love? Love is an emotion. It's a feeling. And in autism, there can be an issue of what we call interception. That is to pick up the internal body cues. Now, that can be your heart rate increases. You perspire more. You go red in the face. You may stutter. You may have all sorts of uh, components in thoughts, and you find that you often think about that person in a really nice way. You go back through positive memories with that individual and so on. So it is exploring an emotion as much as you may explore anxiety and so on. So what we're suggesting here is that you may go through what are the internal feelings that you may have, heart rate and so on. Um, it also means that if you do have someone that you're keen on and they may be keen on you, great. Be honest and say, I, 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 I'm not sure about love. I'm not sure what it is, if I'm feeling it, how to express it. Can you help me? But And actually, that's a, a lovely gift mm -hmm. to the person you're talking to, is to be honest and say, I'm not sure what, what love is. I, I don't know. I can have love for my dog, but for a person, I'm not so sure. I get very excited with my special interest. Is that like love? Is that the excitement that I get with my drain covers as much as you get? Well, actually, it's very similar uh, in a way. So it's being very open with the person to try and explore what are the sensations, what do they feel, but also how to respond mm -hmm. and say, could you guide me here? I, I'm a bit unsure. Um, do, do I need to say that I love you as mm -hmm. well, the reciprocity? Do I need to give you a hug as well? So I would say be honest, which may be very, very helpful in a relationship because mm -hmm. you'll then determine how genuine this person is. And do they have compassion 
for the challenges you face. So be honest. Beautiful. In the same category, I cannot connect emotionally. My wife and I are about to divorce due to my inability to emotionally connect with her. We have two children, both girls, which one was diagnosed with ASD like me. I am 42 years old and I was diagnosed two to three years ago. I am able to mimic and mask very well, to blend in, but in a marriage, the emotional neglect seems to be very apparent to my extremely empathy type wife. Is there anything else we can do or try before it's potentially over? Now, first of all, if you want further information, I'm now going to do a quick plug for a webinar that I uh, made with my friend and colleague, Michelle Garnett, uh, called Autism in Couple Relationships. Mm. It's, I think, five and a half hours. You can access it from www.atwoodandgarnettevents.com. Uh, if you go to tonyatwood.com.au, you can get a link to that page. So it was actually prepared and presented for couples. We go through some of the challenges, what to do. So over five hours, we talk about a lot of components. Now, it's information. You need to find out more, which your partner would certainly appreciate, but it may well give you some ideas of what to do. There are a number of books by Jessica Kingsley Publishers. They publish a whole range of books on autism and especially Maxine Aston and her workbook for couples, second edition. So you can go through with your partner those components. Actually, I would also recommend a relationship counsellor experienced in autism. Otherwise, mm. they may not fully understand what's going on. Mm. Now, when we, when I work with couples, uh, this, this sounds strange, but emotional neglect, <laughs> what we would find out from your partner is, okay, what would you like, we, we assume a husband here, what would you like your husband to do to show affection, right? I would like him to give me a hug. I would like him to give me, okay, right, okay. Now, we're going to do a schedule. We're going to do a chart. And these are the things your wife would like to do, dot, 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 in a column. These are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Sunday. Now, every day, you must give her three expressions of affection. Up to you to decide. When you do, give it a tick that you've done it. <laughs> in other words, it needs an external prompt. This doesn't go to the forefront of their mind. But if this is on the bedroom door, on the fridge, or whatever it is, and you tick, you can use it in a code because of your daughters may be curious about this. There is a tick when you do it. And of course, as you're about to go to bed, oh, I've got to give her another two. <laughs> and you give them. So uh, it is, I'm afraid, what we call an external prompt because the person themselves may not automatically think of it. Also in the same category, the social behavior of gay autistic men Dear Dr. Tony, what is your experience with gay men and autism? I was diagnosed with ASD and showed classic signs such as trying to be friends with only the teachers, lining up my toys, and eating the same foods every day. I also had delayed speech and difficulty with motor skills. However, now as an adult, I can sustain long nonverbal conversations with other gay men when it comes to dating because the secret gay language is very natural to me and I can speak with my eyes, which helps me in the workplace as well. Do you think gay autistic men present autism like women, where they have better social skills than straight autistic men? I don't know. I think that is a wonderful question. Um, could somebody please do some research in this? I think that would be fascinating. Now, the, the beginning may be a discussion uh, on, on Facebook and social media. So when you've got gay couples, this is posted and then ask people um, what's occurring. In research terms, with their answers, you then have uh, what we call them thematic analysis. Mm -hmm. In other words, you analyze what they say for particular themes. What you can do is actually it, from that uh, Facebook social media discussion, you can create a questionnaire that will explore that now you've raised something I think of great value. I can't answer that question because I don't know. It's plausible, but I can't give you an answer with confidence. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's another book we need. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Same category. I don't like kissing. Dear Dr. Tony, I have Asperger's and I have an aversion to being kissed on the mouth in a relationship. What could be the reason for this? And why do people love to kiss each other on the mouth? Thank you in advance. Yeah, if you find this repulsive, um, then it's best not to do it. But again, you need to explain to somebody why that is the case. It's not rejection of the person. It's the tactile, the sensory experience. We were uh, answering a question earlier about cleaning your teeth, but around the mouth and lips in particular, there is an extraordinary sensitivity. And it may be that it's tactile sensitivity. Uh, with cleaning your teeth, well, you do need to clean your teeth at least twice a day. You don't have to kiss people twice a day. So that's something that you don't have to do. Um, so I would suggest in this situation that you have an oversensitivity. Uh, and the interesting thing is, why do neurotypicals really enjoy that sensation, which for you is actually, ah, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, yeah, uh, they, they do. Uh, they just find that it gets to their pleasure zones. And it's one of the links to the pleasure zone is your lips. Uh, the same as, the, as your naughty bits are linked to your pleasure zones. So one of your naughty, well, that's not a naughty bit. One of your pleasure zones is your lips. Uh, and if you don't like that, I think to be very open and honest, but talk with your partner about an alternative. It may not be the lips. It may be the forehead. It can be the cheeks. It could be another way of that tactile experience that isn't so soft, squishy, and repulsive. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tony, the first time in 12 years I think we've ever used the term naughty bits. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very British term. And, and it actually comes from Monty Python. When this was back in the late 60s, they had a, a shape of a person and they had a little arrow, naughty bits. <laughs> okay. All right, this is the category of living with autism, and it has to do with Alzheimer's. I'm very curious about how dementia and possibly Alzheimer's may be related to autistic burnout. I think that's an area I worry a lot about for myself and my partner, and I feel there is a real connection there, hiding beneath the surface. Okay, burnout is a, a topic that is becoming increasingly of interest in, in autism. If you go to my webpage, tonyoutward.com.au, I've got a blog on autistic burnout. And there are certain specific components. I've, I've got the blog here with the information. Um, now, the signs of autistic burnout are physical and mental exhaustion and lack of energy and initiative, increased social withdrawal, almost a form of hibernation, reduced executive functioning, planning, organizing, time perception, Frontal lobes are closed, awaiting recovery, increased sensory sensitivity and anxiety. In other words, all the autistic features become greater, retreating into imagination or the special interest, low self-esteem, depression, uh, loss of self-care skills and persistent inability to function. Now, causes of burnout seem to be due to a lack of autism awareness and accommodation at school, work and within the family, government agencies and society. Feelings of being judged negatively and rejected, being perceived by others as defective, lack of progress academically or at work, more demands at school or work than coping abilities, mm -hmm. loneliness, diminished mental energy and increasing stress and self-doubt. Often the recovery takes a long time. We're talking at least months, sometimes in solitude and sometimes the CBT approach of um, challenge that thought and so No, they just need to go into their shell, basically, and, and hibernate and, and recover and eventually come mm -hmm. out of that shell, but the demands are too much. Now, what this question is saying, yes, we know about burnout, but what about Alzheimer's? Now, I check the research literature uh, on autism regularly, and there was a study in 2021 uh, author is Vivanti, V-I-V-A-N-T-I, and colleagues in the journal Autism Research. And they specifically looked at 
early onset dementia. That is dementia for someone uh, from the ages of about 30 to 65. For neurotypicals, it's about 1% of the population. In autism, with no intellectual disability, around about 4 to 5%, 1 in 20. Mm. That's much more than we first thought. So there is a possibility that there may be early onset dementia occurring. And that really would be talking to your physician, maybe a referral to a neurologist, etc. We don't know why. Is it due to stress? Is it due to autoimmune disorders? Is it due to we really don't know? Um, but early onset dementia, we are recognising in a very small group of autistic individuals. Mm. Dr. Tony, back in February of 2020, we also focused on the subject of burnouts, and we had a number of questions in that category. Here's one of them. Have you done any videos on autistic regression in adulthood? I can't call this burnout. I've had burnout many times and recovered slowly. I'm losing skills, abilities, and knowledge that I never thought was possible to lose. I need to stop the regression first, but how? And is recovery even possible at this point? I'm 42 and bedridden most of the time. I've also had 24 by 7 migraines for over a year. Who does research into autistic regression in adulthood? First of all, there is an association between autism and migraines. However, from your description, this is very significant in reg uh, regression. And if you are bedridden most of the time and a lot of those skills have gone, as we mentioned earlier, uh, early onset dementia needs to be explored and possibly ruled out. But you may have to look at something that may be of neurological basis that may or may not be autistic related. My thoughts are a very good neurologist may be able to have a look at those sciences and sy symptoms, imaging and brain tests, etc. So I am concerned this is so significant. This looks as though it's moved into a medical stroke neurological issue, not simply explained by autism. Hmm. And we always get questions about what is current in autism research. Dr. Tony, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Whilst very accepting of my fabulously quirky six-year-old daughter's Asperger's diagnosis, I'm curious, what is the latest avenues of research with regards to autism and Asperger's? I'm particularly interested in the work going on around fecal microbiota transplants and transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy. Are you able to share a summary, please? Oh, two very different components there. Mm -hmm. Fecal, which is feces. Uh, am I allowed to say this? Shit. Uh, this is <laughs> excretion. What it means is that a long time ago, we noticed that a number of parents of autistic kids referred to their child in the first two years of life having many ear infections, constant ear infections, for which they were prescribed multiple and powerful antibiotics. Antibiotics can clear the gut of flora. And so the question has uh, often occurred, is there a way of reinstalling the appropriate um, gut flora and sometimes it is using um, you, you don't have to eat poo um, mm. you have various ways of, of reintroducing that there's also the issue that there is a higher level now of uh, cesarean section births uh, which is successful for mum and baby but the natural birth canal process involves the baby actually absorbing fecal matter. And that fecal matter can be important for the microbiotic life of the child. Mm -hmm. So I do think that this has a legitimate theoretical model. I don't know that many parents who have actually done that. It's something that you need to explore for each individual. As far as I know, you're not going to do any harm. Uh, but it might be something that could be helpful uh, in a way. You obviously need to go to a specialist who can check what's there and not there and particularly what should be occurring. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yep, 
plausible, not too sure. I'm not necessarily endorsing it. I'm saying, have a try. Now, transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy is using magnetic um, stimulation in various areas of the brain, uh, often to treat uh, conditions like depression. Now, I do have several clients who have used transcranial magnetic stimulation therapy, and they found it beneficial. It's not a, a total cure of the depression, but it has helped. And so it's something you would need to discuss with your psychiatrist. I've had personal experience of clients that have found it useful. I haven't noticed any uh, side effects. It's not like ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which can really affect memory and so on. Um, it doesn't seem to have any particular side effects. It is new. Um, and I think it's, again, something to discuss with a psychiatrist that has used transcranial magnetic stimulation mm -hmm. therapy to see if it would be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tony, that's all the questions we have for today, but we have a good start on questions for the next Ask Dr. Tony. So Ooh. thank you folks for continuing to contribute these, these wonderful queries. So Dr. T, stay well, and maybe I'll see you again in another two months or so. I'm looking forward to it, Craig. Thank you, folks.